One of the things that really impressed me about Alexander Weigers is the fact that he never let loss define him. If you look at his life, he experienced continuous loss. The, the, the first loss, uh, and it was his most tragic loss in his life, was when his first wife died. She was six weeks overdue. He told me at that time they didn't do cesareans and that it ended up killing her and a son. Uh, he would never have children again, uh, although he would sculpt them throughout his life. If you look at the lives of a lot of successful innovators that have come before us, um, everybody from Thomas Edison to Steve Jobs, you see loss being present at some point in the timeline of their lives. You know, loss is an inherent part of all of our lives, and you have to make all negative things positive. He told me that his first sculpture that he really did uh, of anything serious was a memorial to his wife, which I think to this day was still his greatest piece. Alex was the kind of person that moved through life without um, a great number of regrets. Loss, failure are an inherent ingredient in success. And I think once somebody accepts that um, and is inclined to uh, be philosophical and move on to the next thing, the faster they'll ultimately achieve uh, their success goals. One of the things that Alexander Weigers did was embrace the value of constraint. From his early life, he was a nautical engineer, and when he was out on a ship, he couldn't run to the hardware store to find a part. He had to build it himself. And he seemed to really enjoy that self-reliance. Sustainability, that was his, you know, he was ahead of his time there. You know, you don't need to buy anything was his, was his point. You know, you can make it or you can raise it. You really don't need to buy anything. Alex never had any money that I saw. And so he had to practice constraint. Everything he had was used, very used, and he would fix it. We all learned that uh, we could take the raw materials from scrounging almost anywhere and turn them into things we could use ourselves that we didn't have to be limited to going to the store and buying a tool. He, he had that sensibility that said, you can do more with less. His life was so simplified. His bills were so few. You know, he didn't have to worry about many things. And he, did, and he wanted it that way so that he could achieve what he felt was his purpose, which was sculpting. You know, he wanted to, to live that passion. The fact that he had zero dollars he still could come up with the materials to do what it, the art that he wanted to do. And that he was able to make his life work that way is very impressive. So often, companies believe that they need a, a massive research and development budget in order to create things. But in fact, that's not necessarily true. So he would always tell his students is to, you know, find something you're passionate about and you just pursue it. You know, you don't need, every, you don't need anything else to stop you to get in your way. He would take on these challenges and that's a very unusual man, and he'd succeed in the challenges. Alex had this philosophy that if you want to learn, you have to teach. There is no better way to learn than to teach because you're working with smart kids that test you, they challenge you, and they'll test your own values. We were always in awe when he was teaching because he was so smart. But he was a smart man, and if you had an idea that might be better than his, I'd know that he'd pick it up. I think he taught because he wanted to pass on what he knew. Willing to share with people the knowledge that he had, that was the thing that I liked about him. He wasn't keeping his secrets from anyone. He said the difference is that people see strength in learning and weakness in being taught. Being taught versus learning is like eating versus being nourished. To be an effective teacher, you can't just tell or demonstrate, you have to inspire. I learned I can be a tool maker and a tool user more than I knew I could at that time. So to this day, I'm a doer, not a sitter. <laughs> he was a tough teacher, demanded a lot, and we learned a lot. He taught us patience, and he, he taught us how to learn, which is a wonderful thing. He was a great teacher. Whether Alex was building a hinge for a door or the discopter, he felt it was the most important thing in the universe to be doing at that moment in time. He did nothing passively. Whatever he 
uh, put his hand to in the way of arts. <clears throat> he had to master it completely. He, he was insatiable about that. When he was being taught, you had to file for 10 years on various substances before you were a master. 10 years of filing. And he's telling me this well, so I realized I had a long way to go. He felt that we live in a society that's obsessed with time uh, and therefore rushes through things. We were impatient. We wanted to go as fast as we could every day, and he'd have to slow us down because impatience doesn't make quality. Quality comes out of perseverance and education, but also you got to go slow, and it just takes time. And he would not have you do sculpture if he didn't make the tool which today would sound pretty crazy to, to a lot of art students, but at the time, and it did sound crazy to me at the time because I was 15 years old and I wanted to get to do sculpture. You know? He, you know, thought that if you were going to make something, it had to be your very best. Uh, when he learned end grain wood engraving, he learned that in Paris from the last living master, he said was an old man, I think in his 90s. You can't show Alex without showing those engravings because they really tell the story of perfection. It, those engravings, that's a hell of a lot of perfection. He was fascinating to me because he was so focused on his work and there wasn't anything that Alex couldn't do. Alex was adamant about blending art and science. What he called it was courting the middle brain. So you've got the left brain, which is the more logical side, and the right brain, which is the more creative side. What he strove for was to hit that um, meridian right between the two in everything that he did. Alex was an engineer and he was an artist and an, an inventor par excellence. But, you know, all of those things I think he considered an art. If you look at the discopter itself and the blueprints and the renderings, they are art uh, all on their own. I mean, they're the sorts of things that you would want to have on your wall. The disc copter I just loved because it was a, a beautiful looking thing, especially a very futuristic looking. It, it fit that time very well, especially his commercial one, which was very large with the people walking around. The way the windows were designed, I thought was beautiful. When I look at what Alex did as an engineer and his design, his patents and, and the plans, they're unbelievable. And those are very mathematical. But I don't think there was a diviso between left and right brain with him. He had a mathematical brain and he had an unbelievably productive artistic brain. He was such a creator. I mean, I've never known another creator like this man in my life. He was thinking about the intellectual ways of making it work, the mechanics. But the mechanics support the art. He didn't just leave it to math to tell the story. He thought that beauty and design played a role in everything. The Discopter wasn't just a design, it was a story, it was a narrative, it was a vision for how people will live in the future. When he uh, did a sketch of how he envisioned San Francisco, he was very ahead of his time because he liked nature, he loved trees. But he realized if you blacktop everything, you're not going to have it. So he designed all of the roads above the ground so that there would still be Mother Earth down below with trees and vegetation. That was very far ahead of his time. He saw the population of the United States swelling, and he knew that there would be gridlock, and he saw it as a solution to that issue. All of his patents, I was able to look at those plans when I was eight and 10 years old. And they were unbelievable for me to look at as a 10 year old to see these plans. To find out it was done in 1927 is mind boggling. Most people would hand over their blueprints and say, this is what I've invented, it will fly. But what Alex did was he said, here's the discopter and here's why it should fly. And really that's what tell them a story means. It means starting with why. Alex believed in living life as an experiment. And I think that's part of why he feared making money because this life in which he toyed with total constraint 
that that experiment would be over if he ever came into a really serious income stream. Part of Alex's uh, philosophy was to never become entangled with the government. That's why he bartered almost all of his life. He didn't like an income. He knew what it was not to have money, and he knew how to get by without having money. He was a very frugal man, and he would live off the throwaways of the people in Carmel Valley. People would throw things away. They'd throw vehicles away. They'd throw usable lumber away, and he would recycle it. He would recycle the bumpers, the spring steel bumpers, into tools, and he would tell me He'd walk around a truck, this old broken truck with broken windows, and he'd say, this is what we're going to make out of this, and this steel is a different kind of a steel, and we'll make tools out of this part. And the whole truck would become usable. I get to go travel around and see kinds of places where people have built their own cabins, and people who live lifestyles that aren't in the mainstream, and he certainly was an example of that to the extreme. He told me that in the 60s, uh, the kids got it and they would flock to him because he was doing what they were trying to do, which is live off the land, live without entanglements with the government, make your own, uh, make your own way in this life. As we get into a world that's more and more commercialized, that sense of authenticity is lost. And I think that the idea of Alex is sort of a call back to that authenticity that we all knowingly or unknowingly um, seek in our lives. Thank you.